Hello, everyone. Um, thank you very much for having us here. Um, so that is my colleague, uh, Janne Schulz uh, from University uh, of Mannheim. He is the uh, central project manager of uh, the project uh, we are uh, presenting here. Uh, me, I'm uh, Dirk von Sodolitz uh, from uh, Freiburg University. Um, I'm the local uh, manager uh, of the BW Cloud uh, site in Freiburg. Uh, please be warned, uh, this tag is not a technical track. It's more about uh, what uh, modern technologies like uh, OpenStack are uh, doing to your uh, well-established, long-existing institutional uh, framework. And uh, we want to tell you about a little bit um, on the challenges uh, we, uh, we are facing, how to govern a federated science cloud for 20,000 users. Uh, just a little bit on the uh, uh, context um, of um, the setting we are, we are in. So tertiary uh, education in uh, Baden-Württemberg, that is the state uh, we are coming from, uh, just uh, for the geographics, is uh, pretty much in the uh, west uh, south of uh, Germany. Uh, comprising uh, nine universities and other uh, 43 different uh, institutions like arts colleges, teacher training colleges, uh, and so on, which are all managed uh, by the state uh, ministry of uh, higher education, arts, and uh, science. Uh, that means uh, that we have um, each year pretty much uh, of uh, 36, uh, uh, 360,000 uh, students and um, have a significant uh, number of people uh, working in those uh, institutions, uh, which in the end uh, comes down to the uh, fact that there's a significant demand of computational and cloud resources, which uh, should be uh, provided at some point. Uh, so the, we got to the uh, initial uh, situation in 2014 when we uh, started uh, that uh, project that we uh, found that uh, there were no established infrastructures uh, for the uh, deployment of such uh, large-scale uh, resources. Uh, another problem uh, we got is uh, that there were no self-service uh, functionalities uh, offered by the traditional services. So uh, often, for instance, uh, VMware ESX or uh, Hyper-V um, Virtualization infrastructures were already established, uh, but uh, meant uh, to fulfill certain procedures to get up in the, uh, such a resource, uh, which was uh, quite tedious uh, for the uh, half, which was uh, yeah, uh, entitled to and uh, usually impossible, uh, for instance, for students to use. So the idea, uh, idea was uh, to create and operate uh, a federated uh, cloud infrastructure uh, what is usually a thing uh, which is not um, a trivial uh, to handle uh, by a single university uh, computer center. So there were a couple of points uh, we uh, needed to uh, consider when uh, actually designing uh, that uh, project and the setup. In research and science, uh, Usually, uh, commercial providers are often not the primary uh, option. Either the pricing models uh, doesn't necessarily fit, uh, especially if it's on, uh, if you are on uh, some grants and funds, it's often uh, difficult to de uh, dedicate uh, money on uh, such external resources or there are uh, privacy-related uh, issues uh, <clears throat> because of uh, intellectual property uh, research um, and so on. So what we uh, did by then um, was uh, after the uh, ministry, which was uh, over, or which is overseeing uh, seeing those um, different universities, uh, set uh, together with the um, heads of the computer centers in the state and decided to uh, create a federated uh, cloud, which means uh, that not one single university is. Um, providing the service for all, or that all universities are provided with the funds uh, to set up a single cloud uh, for, for, uh, for itself. So the mission was uh, federated infrastructure, which then could be used by all users in uh, tertiary ed uh, education in the state. The, um, 
start of the project uh, by then uh, was uh, to design uh, to decide what kind of an infrastructure uh, should be uh, should be uh, set up uh, so that we uh, can uh, offer an infrastructure as a service uh, to a huge variety uh, of users uh, we uh, we got it uh, was decided um, however, uh, such decisions uh, are made by then uh, that it, uh, there should be four different operating sites. Uh, those operating sites uh, should uh, coordinate uh, to a certain degree, uh, but uh, had certain uh, freedoms on the, uh, on the other end. Uh, all those sites, uh, sites got connected uh, by the dedicated network for educational uh, resources in the state, uh, which provides uh, bandwidth up to 100 gigabits uh, per second which means uh, that there's no much difference uh, for users from non-hosting sites uh, to connect uh, to the cloud and should, uh, shouldn't feel much uh, difference in uh, performance. Uh, the idea was um, that it should work on uh, standard uh, commodity hardware, uh, should provide uh, self-service functionality, uh, different uh, storage backends, uh, should uh, not uh, cost much uh, or not at all uh, license fees, because uh, many of the computer centers uh, had their uh, problematic experience uh, with the typical uh, VMware licensing models, uh, uh, preventing them uh, from properly uh, scaling uh, out. So that was the uh, main uh, objective um, that we uh, can uh, massively scale up uh, if the demand is, uh, is rising. Uh, so we came up uh, with uh, OpenStack as the uh, kind of the most permanent uh, cloud project uh, uh, available in those days. Uh, for our users, uh, we have uh, quite a bit uh, of a variety. Uh, so um, what we what we uh, were doing was uh, to identify certain user groups, uh, which made it then uh, for different uh, use cases, uh, primar uh, primarily uh, research and uh, scientific staff. Um, uh, but then uh, computer centers uh, should be able uh, to host at least parts of their standard services uh, within, uh, the uh, within the cloud infrastructure and of course uh, for standard employees uh, which have certain needs um, to test out uh, services software uh, and so on. And finally uh, providing students uh, with a generic uh, resource uh, for their studies uh, in various fields. At that point, I will hand over to my uh, colleague. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Janne, and I'm the uh, BV Cloud project manager. Um, thank you very much for the insights into the history and the development of the BV Cloud project. So um, let's uh, have a look, closer look at the current and future infrastructure we actually use. The BV Cloud is, as Dirk already said, powered by OpenStack, and we build a multi-region setup, uh, which includes four different regions at four different locations or cities. Each region acts mostly on its own, but we share some key components. For example, we share the um, authentication component Keystone, which is located in Freiburg. The Keystone um, is connected to the statewide identity management system called BVEDM. It acts like EduRoam, so the users can use their institutional credentials to do the registration for our service. We also use some sort of shared glance repository to store and provide um, the list of um, templates for the virtual machines and to ensure that user can access the same list on every region. Um, because of the multi-region setup, um, each region uses its own um, public IP range. But um, the users access the BV Cloud by using the central horizon dashboard. So there's only one point of entry into our system. And once they are logged in, they can choose their desired region. In terms of resources, we offer standard virtual machines in different flavors. Um, I guess we have actually uh, seven different flavors. Users get a virtual machine, get a sub storage attached, um, a public IP, and that's it. But 
for most of them, that's enough. If we take a look at the current uh, hardware, um, then we see uh, a picture which is um, very heterogeneous. You can see that different sides um, have access to different numbers of nodes. That's because each region was encouraged to buy hardware by using their own procedures. That led to the situation that we have to deal with heterogeneous hardware environment, but that's okay. We wanted to, to do that because we wanted to evaluate if we could set up um, a software setup which can handle heterogeneous hardware, and well, it does, it can, it works very good. Um, in, the, in this current setup, we realized the um, hyper-converged architecture with OpenStack and Ceph. We bought no dedicated storage systems, but we bought hard drives which are included in the uh, compute nodes. Um, the whole hardware setup works very well, but we are going to change it a little bit in the future. For example, we are going to um, buy separate storage um, and compute nodes. Um, we want to divide this a little bit. We want to offer two different paths of um, um, scaling up. So when the user comes um, who has demands for huge storage resources, um, we can offer them to say, okay, um, let's increase the storage system by buying new hard drives um, other way around. Um, if we take a closer look at the current uh, available hardware, you will also notice that the number of nodes actually is not that huge. 32 nodes distributed over four regions means um, eight nodes per region. Um, that's not very much, of course, but we are going to scale up this year. So we want to buy or we want to do an investment of almost 800,000 euros, which means that we will spend 200,000 euros only for hardware per region. Um, this is not much, um, but it's more than we have actually. Um, our goal is that we are able to host at least 1,000 virtual machines per region for the start. So let's do a first sum up of what we've heard. The BV Cloud project is a cooperation between different universities and was initially funded by the Ministry of the State. The funding changed over the time. First funding included 100% uh, funding for personal and hardware. But in the second stage, the, during the project, this funding already changed. Only exped expenditures for personal got 100% funding for hardware. They had to be an own share of the operating sites of at least 50%. The good news is our technical infra infrastructure is up and running. We opened the BV Cloud for a greater users community at the end of 2016. And since then, we recognize uh, a steady increase of numbers of registered users. This is the good news, but new challenges arise, especially in the field of governance and steering the BV Cloud. We are very happy to see that this service we are going to offer is obviously something, something the users want to use. And we definitely want to increase the number of users, but we have also to be, be prepared on what's going on and what will come next. So there are some very important obstacles um, we have to deal with actually, and we are going to deal with in the, in the future. For example, how do we organize the process of the distribution of the limited available resources. What is fair in this context? What does it mean? Do we want to follow the policy first come, first serve? Or are there any VIPs who get more resources than others? Um, what's the metrics to decide who is VIP and who not? And of course, there are some very important things to think about the costs. Um, who's going to pay the, pill, the bill? Um, we saw that the ministry uh, paid um, in the past, but they won't pay in the future, at least not for everything. 
Um, and what about the needs and demands of our users community? Um, our users community is very heterogeneous. We are a multi-purpose big cloud, um, cloud infrastructure. So um, we have the whole range of starting from simple students with probably not so much um, or not so huge demands for resources ending up um, with scientists who want to build their own Hadoop cluster and analyze petabytes of data. Um, yeah, all these questions mean that we have to be prepared about our stakeholder and that we have to think especially about their agendas. What do they really want to do? So let's start with the open and hidden agendas. Let's start with the users. The open points are, of course, they want to get reliable resources as fast as they can, um, and they want to scale up. Um, if there are new scenarios they want to do, they want to scale up and want to get more resources. What they don't want to do is to pay for the resources, or at least they want to save as much money as they can. They want to get reliable, trustworthy resources, of course, and it should be cheaper than Amazon or Google, or maybe it costs nothing. So yeah, that's some kind of hidden agenda, maybe, but it's obvious. Um, the next point is the organizations, um, the universities, the colleges, they want to provide a decent um, modern research infrastructure. Um, they want to offer some infrastructures to the students and scientists to increase their attractiveness, of course. They want to, to get, to, they want to increase the number of students, but they also don't want to spend money on various different and individual infrastructures. Um, and they are a little bit curious about corporations. On the one hand, they know that building and running complex infrastructures means often you have to cooperate with others. But on the other hand, they look very closely on their own users and they say, okay, um, what's in the deal for my people, for my users, and how can we maximize that without doing too much work for foreign students? So there is a kind of conflict. The next group of stakeholder is, of course, the group of operators or the computer centers. Um, they have a vital interest in building and running a cloud environment because with a modern infrastructure they can fill the gap between science support and strengthen their role within their own university. Um, especially a cloud environment can break up some monopolies in the field of virtualization, which is typically dominated by VMware for example, and everybody knows about their licenses and their fees, and that's not very, uh, or that's very expensive. Um, and last but not least, those cloud infrastructures allow them to collect and restructure old hardware systems, so they can catch up all those old running systems on the campus field and say, well, you don't have to run this old hardware anymore, we have this cloud resources you can use. The hidden agenda we face is a little bit more difficult. Cloud computing is not only a technology, but it's also a possibility to restructure internal processes. And things become more responsive and faster. DevOps, for example, has not to wait until the needed hardware is delivered. They can speed up their processes. But computer centers tend to be conservative in some ways. The phrase, we always did it that way, so why, to, why change it now, is a quite common and typical phrase, and not everybody is unhappy with that phrase, so yeah. And last but not least, um, we have the group of funding agencies, um, or we want to mention the group of funding agencies. They play, of course, a major role in science and research. They want to ensure that the taxpayers' money is not wasted, but that it is used in a good and efficient manner. They want to support decent research infrastructures to stay within the political competition ahead of their opponents. What they often not intend, or what they often intend but not say, is that they want to encourage the computer centers to start those restructuring processes I earlier talked about. 
restructuring of internal methods and processes to become more agile and to focus more on the demands and needs of the users. Offering a significant funding, for example, for a cloud infrastructure helps a lot to convince the computer centers to go in a new direction. And of course, the funding agencies want to avoid funding dozens of small grant applications. So the process of centralization is also here vital and in their best interest. Yeah. And now I am stuck. Sorry, okay. Um, all those um, different areas um, are the area of governance um, I, I explained and I um, introduced you to. So what is this about? Um, governance um, of the BV Cloud means that we have to handle and manage the expectations uh, and um, demands of the different users and the different stakeholder. Um, what it makes a little bit hard for us is that we are building a new form of cooperation and there is no blueprint, at least not in Baden-Württemberg or in Germany for this kind of um, uh, cloud infrastructure um, we can ask and, and take as a, as a role model, for example. So we have to think about how to do it in our own way and figure out what is the best, at least for Baden-Württemberg. The technical solution we chose earlier is very important because it forms the basis of, for all the subsequent actions and processes. And um, here, oh, the OpenStack portfolio fits perfectly well our needs. So this was a very good choice, of course, to do. Money flow and compensation is also a very important um, subject we have to deal with, um, especially in the public sector. Um, we are facing some obstacles and some problems with money flow. Um, if we talk to the users and say maybe um, the resources will cost, at least in the future, a little bit, they are not very surprised. They say, okay, um, I can understand. Um, I got some resources from you. It's a trustworthy environment. And if I go to Amazon or Google, I have to pay too. So even if I have to pay you a little bit more than Amazon, a little bit, um, it's okay. But um, if we, or the, the point, the problem is we can't actually take this money um, for easy. We have no structure to collect the money, so um, it's a political process to organize all those um, money flow um, processes and um, to ensure, for example, that this money is used for um, scaling up or something else. Um, so even if we want to take money, um, we are currently not able, we are working on it, but we are currently not able to take it. Another point is how to organize external money, which comes in from third parties. I mentioned earlier that um, there may be scientists who want to um, increase our storage system and they bring in their own money. That's well, we are suited for that, but we have to think about um, what kind or we have to think about the amount of this hardware which is exclusively used by the contributor and about the amount of hardware or storage or whatever is used by the public, for example, as compensation. Um, and of course, Dirk already mentioned that point very shortly. Um, re researchers um, have now new possibilities to buy resources, but the funding agencies are not always um, able to handle those new resources. They um, are also, well, they act often in a very traditional way and they want the users to buy their own hardware. Um, and when the users who got the, the grants come up and say, well, there's this system and we can um, buy virtual resources, the funding agencies are a little bit, yeah, we have to convince them that it is equal so that the users don't have to pay uh, to, to buy their own um, hardware. Yeah, 
Next point, of course, um, how to motivate um, users to free unused resources. What about the the um, day to the daily um, operations we have to to face? Um, the hint um, that we will be in the future able to build them is a good point to. Um, encourage the users to, to think about um, what kind of resources they really need. Um, actually, our um, BD Cloud resources are free for all, for all users. No one, nobody has to pay anything. So um, users tend to collect virtual machines and to collect resources more than they need. But um, this is also a point we have limited resources and we will have limited resources so we have to think about mechanisms how to ensure that we deploy or not deploy but um, remove unused um, virtual machines to free the resources for example um, Earlier these days, no, um, I guess it was on Monday or Tuesday, I listened to a talk about the flavor management. Flavor management is also a very important uh, question. Um, we see um, coming up lots of questions or more and more questions about our flavors and they, the users asking us, well, um, can we have this flavor with um, 15 gigs of RAM, not 16, and can we have this combination and uh, stuff like that? We tend to use a very, or we try to use a, a tight flavor management, we call it. Um, we offer at least seven different flavors and we don't want to change it that much. But we have a management for power users so that we can act um, on individual demands. And last but not least, um, of course, very important to keep the connections with the users. Um, we have to keep them updated on a regular basis, and in f we have to do um, meetings. And this becomes um, an issue if you think about the possible number of users um, if we deploy this statewide service. So there will be some kind of point where it is no longer uh, manageable to do um, one meeting uh, in a year, for example. So we have to think about mechanisms to inform them. Yeah, well, what are the takeaway messages? Um, we thought about what can we present to you and what might be interesting for you. Um, Unlike many companies, we do have a very open-minded um, users community, so we don't have to convince them to use cloud resources. Um, if they see BB Cloud is for free, they are very willingly to come to us. Um, and as I stated before, even if we want to, to collect some money or to get money for the resources, we have also problems to um, get this money and to spend it for, for a good reason. Um, once our operating team was um, formed or in place, um, we thought about our technical solutions and you know it, there were many technical solutions on the market. So um, the process of choosing the platform is very crucial. But we also saw during the last two and a half years, I guess, that technology is often not the problem because um, most functionality is already um, in place or invented or people or projects are working on it. So um, technology is mostly not the point. Managing cooperation and federation, that's the point. And it means lots of politics, talking, compromises, discussions, lots of them. And um, if you want to, to build a, a structure like the BB Cloud um, is doing, um, you have to consider um, to hire also people not only doing for the technical stuff, but for doing politics and being diplomatic and um, talking to the heads of the computer centers, heads of ministry, being kind, being polite, but without losing the mission out of focus or out of sight. Um, it's, a, it's a hard process because um, those infrastructure, those, those structures tend to be 
are very conservative and they, they move not that fast. Um, on the one hand, we have this uh, cloud resources which enables the users to do new processes, fast processes, and on the other hand we have those old infrastructures, old structures like universities um, who sit there and say, well, we did it the last 100 years this way, why change it now? When building and running, especially a science cloud, um, do proper planning before the service is launched, this um, yeah, is obvious, but it's, it's crucial. It's um, one of the points um, why the BV Cloud is um, steadily growing at the moment and we are not facing problems during that growing process. We did very lots of plannings um, in the beginning and we calculated, of course, um, also some time for evaluation and testing and um, we played around. We made some mistakes. We um, followed some paths which didn't lead us to uh, the outcome we intended to, but that's very important to um, do experiences, to gain experiences. Um, if you want to build in a structure like that, keep that in mind, that there should be at least a little bit room for errors. And of course, um, talking to other cloud operating infrastructures is also very important to companies, projects, do trainings with the DevOps team, um, very important, very, very good thing, and visit the OpenStack summits <laughs> to get new insights, new impressions. Well, that was it from me for the moment. Um, this is our team. Um, yeah. Thank you for listening to us. Um, I know it's late and, well, if there are any questions, we are happy to, to answer. Okay, the question is how do we do the um, uh, resource um, management? What is fair? Do we use quotas? Indeed, we do use quotas, and those quotas are very limited at the beginning. Um, if a new user is um, registered for the um, BV Cloud, um, he, has, he or she um, has access to all four regions, but only in one region the um, assigned project is equipped with a number of vCore, RAM, and storage and stuff like that. Um, all other three regions, the same project is created, but with zero quota for the moment. Um, we are currently building an, um, uh, an interface or um, some sort of add-on for the Horizon dashboard so that the users can transfer the unused quota from one region to another region. But those quota is very limited at the beginning. We want to steer that process a little bit. First question they ask once they spawn their first virtual machine is how do I get more quota and um, how much can I get? Um, mostly, at least actual, in most times we, we say, well, it's very easy, how much do you want? But um, in the future, there, there will be some sort of mechanisms to sort out. We don't want to um, give, for example, the students too much um, resources. They get some, some resources to, to spawn at least, let's say, um, two smaller or one little bigger um, virtual machine. But we want to um, ensure that the scientists, the projects, the uh, computer centers who, uh, which are also using the BV Cloud get the resources. Yeah. And <clears throat> additionally, there's a, uh, it's um, what, we are, what we are setting up uh, by now. It's a kind of a try and buy scheme. So uh, that the, the researchers uh, get resources uh, to a certain degree in the beginning. And uh, if they are happy with that, uh, the idea is that they kind of can pool money and that money then directly is spent on, uh, on hardware which directly is added uh, to the resource and they get a, a share which 
kind of um, equals to the to the money spent on the on the actual hardware. So th that is an, uh, another model we are we are trying uh, for the beginning. And uh, what you do need is you need a certain base infrastructure in the beginning so that you can show uh, that you actually are able to handle all this. And then uh, people start uh, start to uh, trust you and start to entrust you uh, their money. So that's the idea behind that. Gentlemen, thank you for being here. My name is Scott Fulton. I'm a journalist with the new stack.io. Uh, it was my understanding, and forgive me if, if that comes from American news sources that may have heard it from German news sources, that uh, Chancellor Angela Merkel had a program in mind for a special kind of high-speed internet for Germany that, that was kind of a state internet that was specifically to be uh, invested in by German companies with the intention of providing higher bandwidth internet service for universities and for other public services. Did anything ever happen with that? Or, or do I have my facts a little skewed? Well, that's a very good question. Um, let, me, let me try to give you some sort of I need a picture to show it. I guess this one is very good. You see um, lots of states and um, in Germany um, we tend to divide everything between the states and the states are, um, are trying to get the authority um, on many subjects. So for example the um, question um, if there is a state, uh, um, a federal statewide um, high-speed internet um, for research and academia is a little bit complicated because um, in Baden-Württemberg, um, in our state, we have our own uh, network, the Bellevue called. But it's part of a bigger net, um, the DFN called, the Deutsche Forschungsnetz, for example. Um, I'm not, um, I, I've not in mind exactly um, what you are talking about, but I think that those um, initiatives are often announced and then when it gets to the real realization, they are, are popping lots of stakeholder and whatever up and say, well, we want to play with, uh, within the field and some things tend to, um, um, yeah, distribute in the area of whatever. I hope this doesn't get recorded. <laughs> Otherwise, I... Yeah. So, so the, Anybody the, from the federal government stop watching? It was him, it was him. <laughs> yeah, so the, the typical problem uh, of the federal state is it cannot directly fund uh, research um, infrastructures in the, uh, in the uh, single states. So there are some centralized um, institutions like the uh, German Science Foundation, which is uh, state-sponsored, but then uh, individual researchers apply for grants and then can span it on, on uh, research infrastructures. And the, the state can try uh, to uh, uh, kind of push money into the system, for instance, by the uh, so-called Excellency Initiative, uh, where uh, universities compete against each other and uh, they can bring in uh, huge uh, research clusters um, to compete for that uh, state money. But uh, to spend it on um, infrastructures is quite more, uh, more difficult because of that uh, federal uh, system we got. So higher education, is led by the by the states, and uh, so it's really difficult to directly fund uh, some some infrastructure uh, infrastructure without uh, involving all the states with all their uh, particular uh, interests in that. Or well, let's turn it in a positive way. If Chancellor Merkel is announcing something like that, she has at least to convince sixteen ministries um, to do that. Otherwise, um, nothing would happen. And maybe she is. Uh, it's an ongoing. 
buying process. The positive point is, um, and we stated it here, the responsibility for education and supervision um, is by the ministries of the states, that once you convince the ministry of the state, it's very easy and it goes very fast to get money and to build infrastructure. So that's the good point, but the bad point is if you want to scale up um, above the state level, on a federal level, it becomes really messy. So if the federal government is funding a technology initiative, it's more difficult for universities that depend on state funding uh, to, to acquire or participate in that federal research because, uh, because the, by, by design there's a disconnect there. Yeah. It, is, it is just, um, there are only uh, those indirect ways. Uh, of course, uh, the, uh, the uh, Ministry of, uh, of Research, for instance, uh, can put out um, some, some, some funds and uh, universities and other research institutions can apply for those grants. Uh, that is possible. But uh, usually you just can create a certain framework, uh, can uh, set up some, some goals and then um, uh, yeah, uh, kind of open a challenge and uh, those different institutions can apply. And then you can hope uh, that you have a proper mechanism installed uh, that something is actually happening in the direction uh, you originally uh, desired. Uh, but you cannot actually uh, directly control the whole process from end to end. So that is not really possible in, in the uh, system design we, we got at the moment. Fascinating. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Well, any other questions? Disaster recovery, okay. Um, what, what do you want to, to hear about this? Uh, yeah, uh, for, for uh, that level of service at the moment, uh, we do not have a real disaster recovery in place. Uh, so we have uh, certain precautions uh, so that if uh, parts of systems uh, fail, that for instance it, it would be possible to a certain degree uh, to uh, send a system to another site and uh, start it at that point. Uh, but for instance, uh, the uh, uh, management of the uh, different IP networks and all this is not uh, consistently, uh, consistently uh, handled in that. So lots of manual uh, uh, processes um, are involved uh, in that. So at the moment we have a, a kind of a, a two-tier uh, model, uh, most universities one. So uh, we have uh, those uh, commercial grade um, VMware, Hyper-V are similar uh, virtualization infrastructures which have uh, usually uh, several levels uh, for disaster recovery and uh, redundancy uh, built in and uh, the cloud infrastructure is more meant uh, for, um, for uh, research purposes uh, where for instance uh, a certain service outages are not that crucial than uh, for other, some like a core service of the computer centers. That is at least the state uh, we are in at the moment. We can't live migrate the, the machines between the sites. Yeah, okay. Um, no, we don't do that. So we don't do that sort of disaster recovery. We do use Ceph um, with a replication level, I guess, of, of three. Um, and we also um, put our root disks and the attached storage into our Ceph system. Um, so once the, the compute node fails, there is a chance to restart on the same site. Um, but we do not keep uh, any copies of the data in sync with other regions. We try to build one region above or including two different cities um, with a distance of uh, at least, I, I don't know, 100 kilometers. And um, it worked. 
it worked, but we got some very weird th things to see because um, once you start, for example, a virtual machine on site A and then you move it to compute nodes which are physically located on site B, the whole network traffic might go between those two cities up and around because the breakout point is still located um, in, uh, on site, site A, for example. And what we also saw that um, if the conditions of the OpenStack um, environments change or if, if something a little bit changed, the whole um, region broke together because um, services went into timeouts or couldn't find them. So that's, that was the point why we decided to um, do a multi-region setup with four individual regions and not one huge region. Uh, and in terms of disaster recovery, we encourage the users to try to solve it on an application level, for example. And we will help them, of course. Yeah. So if there are no more questions, <laughs> thank you again. Thank you again for attending. And have a nice flight back, go back, whatever. <laughs> thank you very much.